President Mearns, it gives me great pleasure to affirm your welcome to Ball State University and declare officially that you are now the 17th president of Ball State University. Congratulations. Well, good afternoon. It's a privilege to serve as the president of Ball State University. And Rick, I first want to begin by thanking you for your kind words. And to all of the members of the Board of Trustees, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for giving me this special opportunity. You know, I've said it before, and it uh, bears saying just once again, I know that you are individually and collectively committed to the mission of our university. And Perhaps more importantly, I know very well, I know very well that you have entrusted me with something that you cherish very deeply. And I will honor that trust with my best efforts. Mayor Tyler, thank you for your remarks. Thank you for the key to the city. Does it work? All right. That was unexpected. And as you know, I look forward to continue to working with you as a partner as a true partner to create a vibrant community for all of our friends and for all of our neighbors. And Judd, I was looking for the key that you might have. <laughs> no, I'm grateful, Judd, for your presence and thank you for your participation. You know, as, as people here know, for more than a century, you and your extended family have helped to build this city and this university and you and Tom Bracken you and your extended families, you continue. You continue that proud civic and philanthropic legacy, and we hope you'll do that for another 100 years. You know, all of us, all of us here are the beneficiaries of your generosity and your vision. So again, thank you very much. And how about the, and how about the chamber choir? What you saw on that stage, those of you who are new to this university, what you saw on that stage is talented young men and women, and that's the talent that permeates the student body here at Ball State. They are representative of more than 22,000 students here. So I, I know that this day is a special one for the university and for the community, but I also hope you know that this is a very special day for me and for my family and, and for my friends. And I'm honored that some of my friends and some of my former colleagues, some of my family, friends and colleagues from Cleveland and Northern Kentucky have joined me here today. Thank you. And I want to recognize just a couple people, if I can. First of all, I want to start with Neil King. Wave your hand, Neil. Neil was my father's college classmate, his roommate, and his track teammate. Neil has been a friend of the Mearns family for nearly 70 years. Now, back in the day, Neil was a world-class pole vaulter in the 1940s and 1950s, back when they used bamboo poles and then steel poles. And then he continued to compete as a master's athlete. And I can still remember, some of my siblings may as well, I can still remember their home in Skokie, Illinois, when we lived in Evanston. And I was a young boy at the time. Neil was the only person I knew who had a pole vault runway and pole vaulting pit in the driveway at his house. So, and of course, we had to try it, and I made a few attempts, but I quickly decided to become a distance runner because I didn't want to kill myself. <laughs> Neil, thank you, and Diana, for joining us. Your presence fills our family with so many fond memories. Thank you. So I had also planned today to introduce you to my father-in-law, Jennifer's father, uh, Jim Proud. A, a few weeks ago, the family gathered in Florida at his home to celebrate his 90th birthday. 
And he hasn't been able to travel much over the last few years because he wanted to be home with his wife, Joan, Jennifer's mother, who was ill. Uh, Joan was a kind, loving, and gentle woman. Now, when Jim heard, though, that we were having a big party in Muncie, he told me and Jennifer that he was going to come. But unfortunately, we learned late last evening that because of the impending hurricane, Jim wasn't able to make the trip. But Jim, I know you're watching the program on TV. <laughs> and I want you to know that I have never met anyone who can squeeze more fun and more joy out of every day. You're a role model and an inspiration for all of us, Jim, and we miss you here, but we love you very much. That's deserved, thank you. Thank you. So I'm one of nine kids. Two of the eight siblings are here today. My sister, Leslie, flew in from Montana with her son, Jason, who lives in Los Angeles. It's so good to see you. And my sister, Tracy, and her husband, Eddie, they drove in from Cleveland this morning. Thanks, you guys. I love you very much. You also know that three of my uh, four daughters, Bridget and Christina and Claire, are here. Bridget uh, took the red eye in from San Francisco last night, arrived just this morning, and Christina drove in this morning from Cleveland. Uh, my twins weren't able to be here. Poor Jeffrey, he's uh, struggling through this fall semester in a study abroad program in Siena, Italy. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. And Molly is a sophomore, his twin sister, my youngest child, Molly is a sophomore at the University of Michigan and just finished her first week of classes. And apparently I looked at the schedule, they've got a home football game tomorrow and uh, she's got to make sure that the team is prepared. So <laughs> Molly, how you doing? And you've heard from Claire. And as you can see, she's, uh, she's pretty darn special. Uh, but we're going to talk about those, what stays in the van, you know, happens in the van, stays in the van a little later. You know, the wonderful thing that you should know is that all of my children are special. Now, each of them is different. They have different interests and different personalities, but they share some common traits. Each one is bright. Each one is articulate. Each one is poised. And uh, most importantly, as a father, each one is very kind. And no father has been more blessed than I've been. My children, though, have also been blessed, and that's because my wife, Jennifer, is their mother. Now, they're fortunate because as a result of some fluke of nature, they got all of her genes and none of mine. Um, and what you should know, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't met Jennifer, that you are also very fortunate. You're very fortunate because Jennifer Proud Mearns is the newest member of this community. Thanks, Jennifer. And again, to all of you, thank you. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I'm honored by your presence. So three weeks ago in this auditorium and at this podium, I had the opportunity for the first time to speak to the faculty and the staff and the board and some students at our annual fall convocation. During my remarks, I shared some of the impressions that I gained during my first three months as the president here at Ball State. I, talked about our achievements, and I also talked about our future, a future that we know for all of higher education, a future that presents some challenges. But in my estimation, and what I spoke about was that our future also prevent, presents many exciting opportunities. As you know, those are from, who have been here at Ball State for a while, you know we've gone through a protracted transition in leadership, but this institution is strong. It is getting stronger day by day, month by month, year by year, and that is just a fact. And that's because we've earned an excellent reputation for academic quality and academic innovation across a wide range of disciplines and programs. And that reputation for excellence and rigor continues to improve. Our facilities are also outstanding, and they're getting better as well. Right across the street, as you walked in, right across the street, the construction of our new health professions building is well underway. This $62 million project is fully funded by our General Assembly. And last spring, the state appropriated an additional $87 million to allow us to design and build a new foundational science building, which is also going to be constructed on the East Quad. 
As Rick mentioned earlier, we are grateful to our colleagues, to the governor and to our colleagues in the General Assembly for that extraordinary support. As a result of their support, our university's financial condition is sound. For many years, we've managed our resources prudently and strategically, and this practice, as well as that additional operating support from the state, this practice enabled our board in June to approve the smallest undergraduate tuition rate increase in more than 40 years. So our affordable tuition, our beautiful modern facilities, our excellent academic programs, all of these continue to attract more and more outstanding students to Ball State. This fall, we enrolled more than 4,000 new freshmen, the second largest freshman class in our history. We were just three students, just three students shy of enrolling the largest freshman class ever. And, com and compared to the all-time freshman record, enrollment record, which occurred in the fall of 1997, this year's class of new students is more academically qualified and much more diverse than that class. And in terms of overall enrollment, we set an all-time record this fall. We now have more students enrolled, enrolled at Ball State than in any year in our history. And that's good, but more importantly, more importantly, the number of students who graduate each year has been increasing even more dramatically. And I want to give you just one statistic. In 2010, we conferred approximately 4,800 degrees. Last year, only seven years later, our students earned approximately 5,800 degrees. In just seven years, that's a 20% increase. We now have 190,000 graduates living and working here in Muncie, Delaware County, and in Indiana, and in countries literally all around the world. And during my remarks at the convocation, I spoke about a few of our recent graduates. They've embarked on successful careers because of the education that they received here. And they've been inspired by our faculty and inspired by our staff to lead meaningful lives, lives defined by service to others. So this progress, this progress in my estimation is remarkable. And there are many people in this auditorium today, and there are many more all across our campus who deserve our appreciation for these achievements. But at the convocation, I also took a few moments to remind the faculty and staff that we are indebted to the people who founded this institution nearly 100 years ago. And we owe a debt to the women and the men who transformed a small teacher's college into the modern comprehensive research institution that we are so fortunate to have inherited. And I want to take a few moments today to just brief, speak briefly about this history, because I believe, and I assume we all believe, that our history, this past, should inform how we plan for the future. Ball State, as you know, began as a public state-assisted teacher's college in 1918. But as Judd referred, and as many of you know, this new college wasn't the first attempt to bring higher education to Muncie. In fact, there were four prior efforts to start a college or a university in Muncie. The Eastern Indiana Normal School, Indiana Normal School in 1899, Palmer University in 1902, the Indiana Normal School and College of Applied Technology in 1905, and then the Muncie Normal Institute in 1912. All four of these attempts failed, and they failed very quickly. But these unsuccessful efforts were not total failures. To the contrary, these unsuccessful efforts demonstrated some very important positive attributes about this community. Our predecessors, like us, have the audacity to dream bold dreams. And these initial failures, they didn't deter them. They were just temporary setbacks that would soon be overcome. And so as we embark on a process to develop our next strategic plan, I hope we will internalize these lessons. I want us to emulate our founders. Let's continue to be innovative and creative. Let's embrace change. Let's take some risks. Let's not fear failure. Let's be persistent. Let's be tenacious. Let's have the courage and the audacity to pursue an ambitious long-term vision for the university. And let's examine that history. You know, after all, we're an academic institution. That's what we do. So we should study the past so that we can learn from those experiences. 
So then what is it that led to our success after our founding in 1918? Of course, there are many factors. Talented, creative faculty, dedicated staff, good leadership, loyal alumni. But after speaking to our resident historian, Professor Bruce Galehead, and after reading his book, which is called An Interpretive History of Ball State University, after that conversation and reading his history, I believe that there is another determinative factor that has contributed to our success. And that factor is the sustained generosity of the people of Muncie. And I want to share just a few examples. And Judd referred to the first one in his remarks. Between 1918 and 1929, there were many significant improvements on campus. The state funded construction of three new facilities, a science building, the library, and the Burris Laboratory School. But the members of the Ball family, who invested their own money to establish the new teacher's college, also donated even more money to build a new gymnasium and to build a dormitory for women students. These private gifts, it was these private gifts that ensured that the new college would survive. Another period of dramatic growth and expansion occurred much later in the 1960s and 1970s. And as you heard in Judd's remarks, one of the most significant and enduring physical manifestations of that era is Emmons Auditorium. This beautiful space, as the mayor referred to, this beautiful space where we have gathered today. As you heard, because state law prohibits the use of state dollars for non-instructional buildings like this one, the university had to raise a significant amount of private contributions to build this auditorium. And it was because of the generosity of the Muncie community that Ball State received the private donations that we needed in order to reach that goal. And I recently had a chance to review the program for the official dedication. President Emmons, for whom this auditorium is named, said that Ball State as an institution and all individual Ball State employees should be, and this is his words, all Ball State employees should be good citizens because it is good business to be good citizens. Sounds pretty familiar. And Frank Bernard, who helped lead the fundraising campaign, that critical fundraising campaign, he, he said as follows. This is a quote. Only an extraordinary romance, an extraordinary romance between town and gown could have brought forth such a beautiful progeny, an edifice designed to serve well the cultural aspirations not only of our age, but of all generations yet unborn. And those words are as relevant today as they were more than 50 years ago. Indeed, this town-gown collaboration, this extraordinary romance, it continues to this day. And that's because a substantial portion of the cost of the recent renovations, what you've seen in this lobby and what you see out front, a significant portion of the funds needed for those renovations were generated by private philanthropic contributions. The third and final example of the exceptional support from the community for Ball State comes in our university's first capital campaign in the 1980s and early 1990s. The campaign was successful. We raised more than $44 million. Steve Anderson, Steve, raise your hand. Steve Anderson was the chair of that campaign, and we're grateful that you're here uh, this afternoon. And as, <laughs> and in that campaign, our alumni were generous, but 59% of the money, 59% of that $44 million was donated to the campaign from the community from corporations, from foundations, and from other friends. That is a remarkable statistic. And it confirms my principal point. From our inception to the present day, our university has received extraordinary support from our neighbors. As a result of their vision and their generosity, we are an outstanding university, and we are poised for an even brighter future. So given this history, what are we now called upon to do? To me, the answer to that question is clear. First, we must recognize that the future of our university will continue to be inextricably intertwined with the future of, money, of Muncie. As I've said, our university is strong and it's getting stronger, but as you well know, Muncie is facing some challenges, primarily because of the adverse effects of external economic forces. 
These changes in the economy have substantially reduced the number of manufacturing jobs in this city and in this county, and that in turn has caused a decline in our local population. And the Muncie public schools have been hit particularly hard. Now, I suspect that some of our faculty and some of our staff have children who attend a Muncie public school. But I suspect that many of the children of our faculty and staff do not. Mine don't. So as I've, I've thought about this, I've asked myself, and perhaps all of us should ask ourselves, what would you do? What would you do if the students in the Muncie Public Schools were your children? If they were your grandchildren? What would you do? I believe the answer to this question is also clear. We all must do more for our schools and for our community, because if Muncie continues to stagnate, that stagnation will impede our ability to secure a bright future for our university. In short, we here at Ball State, we have a self-interest. We have a self-interest to support our schools and to help rejuvenate our community. I also think that we have a moral obligation, a moral obligation to enhance our commitment to Muncie. That obligation derives from a simple principle because we can't pay, repay those who have nurtured and sustained our own development, we must pay it forward. We must pay it forward to our neighbors and to the next generation. And I want to bring this general proposition right here to our campus. It was something that Judd mentioned as well. Just a few hundred yards from here is beneficence. The statue, as, Joe, as Judd said, the statue that is the iconic symbol of Ball State University. The Muncie Chamber of Commerce, the Muncie Chamber of Commerce commissioned the creation of this statue from Daniel Chester French, the man who sculpted the statue of President Lincoln that is now in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And in the midst of the Great Depression, in the midst of the Great Depression, the citizens of Muncie donated $450,000 to construct beneficence. And they chose to install beneficence right here on our campus. What a gift. What a gift. It's another tangible example of Muncie's extraordinary contributions to our university. As Rick said, and as you know, beneficence embodies our continuing commitment to several enduring values, values like excellence, integrity, and respect. But beneficence also reminds us of the importance of gratitude. Now, gratitude means more than just a verbal expression of appreciation. Of course, that expression of appreciation is necessary to be grateful, but it's not sufficient. Genuine gratitude requires us to act. Genuine gratitude requires us to serve others who need us. Simply put, Beneficence reminds us now of our moral obligation to support our neighbors. And for me, this obligation is not just institutional, it is personal. At the announcement of my appointment in January, I spoke briefly about my parents. And I want to share just a bit more about them because it's relevant, it's pertinent to my principal point. I told you at that time in January across the street in Sursa Hall, I told you that my father was the first in our family to earn a college degree. I described how that opportunity transformed his life and it changed the trajectory of our whole family. He committed his entire professional life to teaching as a law professor, as an educator. But his commitment to education extended far beyond the walls of his classrooms and far beyond the boundaries of any university campus. In 1961, my father was appointed to serve as a consultant to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. In the early 1960s, for two years, he traveled across the South to prepare a report on the status of school desegregation in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education. Fifteen years later, in the mid-1970s, my father was appointed by a federal judge to draft the court-ordered plan to desegregate the Cleveland Public Schools. My father passionately believed that every child, that every child had a fundamental right to a quality education. Not just his children, not just the children in the communities where we lived, but every child. 
every child. In January, I also talked a bit about my mother. I told you that after raising nine children, she served 10 years as a city council member in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and then, Mr. Mayor, she was elected as the first woman mayor of that city, and she served two four-year terms. As an elected official, my mother wasn't particularly preoccupied with building shopping centers and office complexes. She understood that those projects were beneficial to local and regional economic development, so she supported them. But my mother was much more interested in building a community center for senior citizens and building playgrounds for children and building playrooms for toddlers. And she built genuine personal relationships with people. To my mother, the citizens of Shaker Heights weren't voters. They were her friends. They were her neighbors. My mother greeted everyone with a kind word and a warm smile. And if she had met you just once, right? If she had met you just once, she would remember your name and she would remember the name of your children. That wasn't a political skill. It wasn't a stunt. It wasn't a skill that she developed just to secure votes. She remembered your name instinctively because she cared, because she cared about you. In their private lives, my parents taught us the meaning of true love. They showed us through their actions that perfect love makes sacrifice a joy. And in their professional lives, in their public lives, my parents showed us what servant leadership truly means, and that the word servant always comes first. They demonstrated to all of us that the scope of our moral obligation to serve other people wasn't articulated, it wasn't confined by the four corners of a job description. And that's because for my parents, their responsibility to serve others sprang from what was in their hearts, from their deep abiding compassion for all people. Through their actions, they taught us that each day, each day we are called to advance the common good. At the beginning of my remarks today, I renewed my commitment to work hard to advance the mission of our university. And as an integral component of that commitment, my commitment to our mission, and to honor the memory of my parents, I will encourage our faculty and our staff and our alumni and our friends, I will try to mobilize this small army of talented women and men to partner with our friends and neighbors to secure a bright, vibrant future for Muncie. And that's simple. It's simple because that is what our history has shown us and that is what my parents taught me, that we are all better together. We're better together. Thank you very much.